Daniel chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. Listen for God's word. When Daniel learned that the document had been signed, he went to his house. Now his upper room had open windows that faced Jerusalem. Daniel knelt down, prayed, and praised his God three times that day, just like he always did. Just then, these men, all ganged together, came upon Daniel praying and seeking mercy from his God. They then went and talked to the king about the law. Your majesty, didn't you sign a law that for 30 days any person who prays to any god or human being besides you, your majesty would be thrown into a pit of lions? The king replied, the decision is absolutely firm in accordance with the law of Medea and Persia, which cannot be annulled. So they said to the king, one of the Judean exiles, Daniel, has ignored you, your majesty as well as the law you signed. He says his prayers three times a day. And now we'll turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. Jesus says, And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was time for bed, and the little boy wanted his mother and grandmother to come to his room to tuck him in. Before he climbed under the covers, he was kneeling beside his bed and softly saying his prayers. Dear God, please bless Mommy and Daddy and all the family, and please give me a good night's sleep. Suddenly he looked up and shouted, and don't forget to get me a bicycle for my birthday. His mother hushed him and said, there's no need to shout like that. God's not deaf. No, said the little boy, but grandma is. <laughs> the father of the Protestant revolution, Martin Luther, said to be Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Prayer is considered the essential expression of how God relates with us and how we relate with God. The prophets of the Old Testament prayed. King David wrote his prayers in song form that we now read as psalms. The Gospels tell us that Jesus made it a habit to slip away by himself to pray. But if we're looking for the verses in Scripture that announce prayer as a spiritual practice, and give us an introductory course on prayer for beginners. I'm afraid we'll never find it. As vital 
and significant as prayer is in the living out of our faith, it's never explicitly defined in the Bible. Is prayer talking to God? Is it also listening to God? Can prayer take the shape of contemplating and reflecting on God's presence? Prayer is many things. But there are many things that prayer is not. One of the Gospels reports the disciples asking Jesus to teach them to pray. He noticed that even the religious leaders of his day were unclear on the practice and purpose of prayer. So in his Sermon on the Mount, he included some do's and don'ts to help guide us in our prayer life. This morning, we'll take a look at three do's and three don'ts when it comes to prayer, according to Jesus. We've all experienced people who make prayer into a spectacle. We've seen athletes kneeling in the end zone after a touchdown. Arguments over prayer in school or at government meetings. And we've grown tired over the empty catchphrase of offering thoughts and prayers after a tragedy. We won't attempt to know the heart of every person but we know enough to realize that the mention or motion of prayer has become a tool for trying to elevate oneself in public opinion. In Jesus' day, some Pharisees used prayer as a sacred status symbol, a way of taunting the public with their perceived prominent standing next to God. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells a story about a Pharisee praying on the temple steps, presumably within earshot of everyone passing by, saying, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, thieves and rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. Essentially, the prayer is announcing how good the Pharisee is compared to how awful everyone else is. Jesus' first don't concerning prayer is don't make prayer a performance. He calls prayers that draw attention to ourselves hypocritical. Hypocrite literally means an actor. Someone on a stage playing the part of a character. Jesus' warning is not against praying in public places. But if our primary concern is to be seen or heard by anyone other than God, then our prayer is nothing more than an act. Instead, Jesus says, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who's in secret. The first do concerning prayer is do pray with authenticity. In the privacy we find behind closed doors, we're free to be present and to present ourselves to God as we truly are, as God already knows us to be. Christ teaches us to find space to pray where we can be truly honest with God about our joys and our sorrows, about our, our doubts and our concerns, even our disappointments and our frustrations. Away from the temptation to make prayer a display for anyone else, we can be fully present in the moment with God. As the Quaker writer and teacher Douglas Steer writes, in order to pray, you have to stop being too elsewhere and to be there. Don't make prayer a performance. Do pray with authenticity. 
Well, if you've ever been a part of a group, even a group of Christian people, and the question is raised about who would volunteer to lead the group in prayer, you know that most everyone tries their best not to make eye contact until someone else is selected to lead the prayer. Should we test this theory this morning? It's probably not because of the first warning about making prayer a performance as much as it is that many of us are just unsure about what to say. We've probably all experienced another person praying and we felt like they did such a good job using all the right words and their thoughts were so organized and their prayer just seemed so right. But Jesus doesn't want us to stress over saying all the right things. His second don't concerning prayer is don't search for the magic words. If our prayer sounds something like, I beseech thee, O most holy one, by all the transcendent glory of thy name to clothe thy loved ones in the robe of justice, and to illumine their beings with the light of trustworthiness. Thou art the one that hath power to do all that thou pleaseth, and who holdeth within thine grasp the reins of all things visible and invisible. That's actually not a bad prayer, if that's the way you normally talk. But if we're trying to elevate our language because we think that's what God expects of us, Jesus says we're wrong. Christ reminds us that our Father knows what we need even before we ask. There are no magic words to access God's attention. So our attempts to use language we don't even fully understand is more of a hindrance to our prayer. Instead, Jesus teaches us to keep our prayers simple and focused. The second do concerning prayer is do say what you mean. Every Sunday, and today is no different, we include in our worship the saying of the prayer that Jesus taught us, which we now call the Lord's Prayer. He didn't tell us to recite it word for word, but he offered it as a guide to shape our prayers. We don't believe the Lord's Prayer to be a secret code that unlocks God's willingness to listen to us. We believe the Lord's Prayer to point our hearts and minds toward God's purposes for us and for the world. Unfortunately, many of us have been reciting the words of the Lord's Prayer for so long that we've learned to say the words while our minds are wandering somewhere else. Christ's reminder to us, while using the Lord's Prayer or any other prayer, is don't search for magic words, but do say what you mean. There once was a monk who was told to pray for all who suffer. One day a hungry beggar came to the monastery and told him he was looking for food. The monk stretched out his hand, placed it on the beggar's shoulder, and prayed that God would be with him, that his belly would be full of good things. That night at supper, his elder asked the monk how his day went. The monk excitedly told the elder about his encounter with the beggar and how he had the honor of praying with him that his belly would be filled. After he listened to the story, the elder gently asked him, and what did you do to feed the man? The monk, looking perplexed, shook his head. No, he said, I, I prayed for the man. The elder smiled warmly. Then, dear brother, he said, your prayer is only halfway finished. 
many times all we can do is pray. And in those cases, prayer is more than enough. But other times we hide behind prayer as an alternative to allowing God to work out his purposes through us. If we allow prayer to orient us toward the will of God, we're not only pointing out the struggles that we notice in the world, we're opening ourselves to the possibility that God is calling us to join in the efforts to heal what is broken, to reconcile what is divided, to work for justice where there is corruption. In his third don't regarding prayer, Jesus teaches us don't pray for anything that you are not willing to participate in. All of us want to know what for, that forgiveness is available to us when we stumble and fall. But Jesus teaches that we should only be willing to ask for forgiveness if we're willing to take part in sharing it with others. He makes his point using forgiveness as the topic because that's one that hits so close to home for so many of us. But the idea applies to so many other things. We don't pray for peace when we're content contributing to the chaos. We don't pray for unity when our actions promote division. We don't pray for guidance if we're not willing to move our feet. Instead, in his final do regarding prayer. Jesus teaches us, do put your prayers into action. If it's forgiveness we seek, chances are there's someone we need to learn to forgive. Maybe we're watching the news and offering a prayer for the peace of the world. Take that as an opportunity to imagine how we contribute to the peace of our town our church, and our home. As you pray for children in difficult family environments, think about the opportunities you have to positively impact the lives of children around you. When we lift up prayers of thanks, reflect on the ways our attitudes communicate that gratitude to the people around us. Every prayer that we offer is an invitation from God to engage the world around us in ways that we are able. Of all the times that Jesus found a private place to pray, we have very few examples of what those prayers included. But one of his prayers was only one sentence long. And it was recorded word for word in Luke's gospel. The simple words of this prayer carry the most profound power. And Jesus followed his do's and don'ts of prayer. He didn't make the prayer a performance. But he did speak with genuine authenticity. He didn't use any magic words, but he said exactly what he meant. And he didn't utter a word he wasn't willing to participate in. But he very much put the prayer into action. It was the prayer that he spoke as he was hanging on the cross. Looking out over all those responsible for his death and holding the weight of the sin of the world, including yours and mine. He found the strength to pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Authentic, straightforward, carried out by Christ. Nobody expects us to offer the perfect prayer especially not God. 
He already knows what we need before we say it. So we may as well be honest. We're all still learning to 